was wonderful. Every question that I had along the way eventually addressed in the, in the discussion that you gave us. And so I did have two questions, but I don't want to take up other people's just so that we have kind of an order. Um, if you guys click on the participants tab at the bottom and you look in the bottom right of your screen, you'll see a bunch of buttons you can click. If you click any one of the buttons, maybe just to let me know that you have a question, and that way we can proceed uh, in an orderly manner. You should all see that I clicked the e button. There's usually a raised hand, but I don't see it. So we can just use any buttons to indicate they have a question. But, um, Sayedna, maybe just to start us off, um, one question I had is, of course, we live in a country where there's a separation between the church and the state. And um, as you said, we are often in a position where we are trying to love the sinner, but detest the sin. How does this translate into our viewpoint on public issues? Public what? On public issues. issues. For example, like voting. Um, and how should we approach trying to evaluate, um, you know, trying to make a decision that would affect us all in the same country that we're living in? From church perspective, we need to educate people about the importance of voting. We need to educate people on uh, how to vote and to educate them about the roles or, or the agenda of every uh, candidate. Uh, and then to guide them to use biblical standards when they make their final decision about voting. All this who are not intervening with the, the, the state or the politics. These are Christian principles. But if we are supporting one candidate against another or one party against another, this is actually not the, the rule of the church. Also, we encourage our youth to, to pursue political careers and uh, I, I, I will be very happy to see some of you uh, on the Congress or uh, Senate or even uh, nominating yourself to be President of the United States. But my advice here, because some people, when they reach this level, the first thing they do, they forget about the oppressed and the underprivileged. Maybe the pressure of politics uh, is so strong to make them forget uh, wh why they want this. If you wanted for prestige, if you wanted for power, if you wanted for money, don't pursue it. But if you wanted actually to seek justice, as the Lord told us in Micah today and in Isaiah, then I encourage you to pursue this goal. But again, don't forget if one day you reach this level, don't forget why God put you here in this position. Sometimes we contact people who actually reached high uh, positions in the government and just to ask them to defend innocent people, really innocent people. And we are ignored completely. So remember what I'm telling you right now, if God one day uh, appointed you in one of these positions, remember why you are there. Why you are there. I see Sandra raising her hand. 
I can unmute yourself, Sandra. I cannot hear you. Sorry. Okay. First, I'm so happy to see you. Um, but my question is kind of two separate ideas. Um, first, I know you said you'd love to see me one day sit on Congress, sit on the legislature, do all those things. Um, I don't remember what sermon I heard, but um, whoever gave it was talking about how our early church fathers heavily advised us not to go into politics or theater or Hollywood or those two routes because of how inherently evil they are and how they're driven by money. So as much as you know, we might go sit in those positions because we want to do good, we're still heavily swayed by people above us or people with money who are donating to our campaign. And so, so kind of, can you touch on that a little bit? I think the church fathers spoke from experience. As I just told you, when we try to contact a person on this position, you know, they, to defend an oppressed person, unfortunately, power and authority and money and prestige blind the people. So they forget why they are there. That's why maybe, the, uh, uh, not maybe, the early church fathers actually warned against this in order to protect you from this blindness of the authority, of the power. But there are many people, King Constantine, you know, he opened the churches uh, and we honor him and we venerate him. So there are many people who were in the government, in authority. Uh, in, in Egypt, in the Coptic history, in Ma'alim Ibrahim al Gohari, he was like a prime minister. And, and he helped, you know, the oppressed, helped the poor. So there are many people actually who, who get into these positions, but they were faithful to God, faithful to, uh, to seek justice and to pursue justice for everybody. Okay, so the second goal to this is more of kind of like a spirituality and my own walk with God question. So many times, especially with everything happening right now in the world and we're coming up to elections, I find myself withdrawn wanting to be quiet and not say anything at all, right? Because everybody has an opinion, right? And all of, especially my generation, we feel very entitled to our opinion, right? So it becomes more difficult to have those conversations to understand because everybody has their hard stance one way or the other. So in, in, you know, kind of staying in my shell as a turtle and not speaking up, is that in itself a sin? Because I know I'm called to speak truth, right? But sometimes I feel like everyone around me has their opinions and they're set on their opinions. They find them to be absolute truths. So in that situation, is it a sin if I decide to say nothing at all? Okay. It is not wise to speak or to volunteer your opinion to a person who is not willing to listen. Uh, so, for example, when Pilate asked the Lord Jesus Christ, what is truth? The Lord did not answer him because Pilate will not listen. But when a person goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, like the disciples, Lord teach us how to pray, he answered. So, just to choose to be quiet, period? No, that's not right. But don't waste your time with people, as you said, they, they are entitled to their opinion, they are not willing to, to listen objectively, they are blinded by their opinions or the social media or whatever. Then it's a waste of time to, 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 to speak to them. But on the other side, be careful in making this judgment. I'm not, now I will not be speaking about you personally. But maybe sometimes because I'm so entitled to my opinion, I see others entitled to my opinion. So this is like a projection of, of my blindness. You know? So be careful in making this judgment that whether these people are willing to, to listen or not. But when we take everything and we examine it in the light of the gospel and the light of the word of God, then actually we will be able to, to, to think objectively and not allow what the world put in our mind to direct us. Mm. Okay. William, you said you have two questions. You said only one question. 
I, I do have so many questions, but so we many have so questions. many people that raised their hands. Maybe we can give them an opportunity. Uh, there are five pe persons raised their hands, okay? Yeah. yeah. How about Alex? I think you are the next one. Okay. Alex. Hi, Sayedna. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I really appreciated it, and thank you for taking your time to, to be with us. Thank you, Alex. Um, my my question is um it's a little bit similar to sandra's um i feel that i mean at least growing up and maybe i was blind to it but i i feel that people in general were not as political and were not as um heavily in, involved in the debate and in politics as as they are now um and I feel that there's this, maybe this extra dependence upon, um, upon the government, or maybe, I, I mean, I feel that some people think, you know, that morally they have to be involved in, in, in politics, otherwise um, they're not doing their duty. Um, and to some extent, I think that that's correct, but I also think that people are so involved in politics, I think that's it's potentially damaging to their spirituality. So I'm just curious as to, um, Niefta, to your opinion on, um, I guess, the current climate, how how involved and how loud people are with their, with their politics, um, and what sort of balance, I think, should we have I think you answered the question by uh, by saying balance. Uh, you know, we are living in a community, in a society. To exclude yourself completely from the, the politics, uh, then actually, how can you influence the society in which you are living? Uh, you are living, so you cannot. Uh, exclude yourself completely but when actually you are too too involved to the extent you neglect yourself you neglect your family you neglect your church you neglect your education or whatever uh, then you lost the balance so with self-examination uh, and faithfulness with oneself I think uh, you, you will be able to, to see whether you are in the right balance or not. So yeah, my recommendation is uh, every now and then, maybe once every week, uh, have like a 15 minute just with yourself only and pray and see where are you going with this involvement with the politics? Where are you? Is this helping you? Is this helping the society? Is this helping uh, you spiritually? Is this helping your friend? Or you are just getting in fights and, and actually uh, you, you are pulled toward uh, useless and, 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 and idle talks that will not edify. You know, St. Paul said, whatever you do, whether eating or drinking or doing anything else, do it for the glory of God. So, am I glorifying God with all of this or not? So again, the, the key word to answer your question is balance. Balance, uh, I examine myself through the direction of the Holy Trinity and the Word of God. Thank you, Zayn. Sorry, just a quick follow-up. I'm sorry. I found that whenever I talk to somebody online, maybe through Facebook or something, that's usually very damaging. But when I talk to somebody in person, or on the phone, you know, at least where we have a back and forth communication where we can understand each other maybe better. That's been fairly successful. Okay. Um, Here you go. Yeah. Uh, and I'm again, curious with your opinion on that. Yeah. Again, sometimes the text, the social media, the emails does not express the, the real opinion. You know, even St. Saint, Saint John said, I have many things to, to say to you, but I don't want to write them in a letter. But when I come, I will discuss it with you in, in person. You can read it in the second letter of St. John. So uh, definitely discussing such important issues in person 
will be more effective. Thank you. I think next one is uh, Christine, Christine Ferris. Hi, Sayedna. Thank you so much for speaking with us. This was a really um, great talk. I guess um, my question is, and I think I'm just like speaking to this question from a personal place. Um, so you said to work on ourselves as individuals and then on our family and then our church. Um, but of course we can always do better as individuals. I mean, like we're never going to be in a place where I don't know, we feel like, okay, now I'm good enough that I can work on my family and my church. So how can we, I guess, work on our family and our church uh, with humility uh, while still working on ourselves? Thank you for saying this. Because that's why I start by saying change yourself before I say the family or uh, the church. Part of changing myself is to know my limitation and it is not me who would change the family. It is not me who would change the church or the community, but I am the tool. I am a tool in the hand of God. I'm just a tool. So I am like a pen in the hand of God and God is writing by me. That's who I am. So if it comes to my mind that I, Anna, am by Yusuf, I will change the world, or change my family, I should actually uh, set aside until I understand, no, it's not me. It is God who works in me. I am nothing, you know? Uh, so uh, I, I advise all of you and my, including myself, if at any moment I perceive that I can do change, I should not do anything un until I learn what humbleness is. Thank you, Christine. I think next wine uh, is Nancy Mikhail. Sayedna, thank you so much for coming. I was wondering, it's like you were saying, you kind of use your own discretion to know when you should be talking and when you should keep silent. But in the times that maybe we do have these discussions with our Sunday school kids or our family members, how do we lead with love during a heated argument that just ended up being heated? Like you're put in a scenario where you have to speak up, but think tensions are running high, emotions are running high. So how do we maintain that peace and that love during those moments? Thank you, Nancy. You know why emotions uh, getting up and discussion become heated? Because we want to persuade one another want to convince one another. But we need to say the truth without trying to persuade the other. The Lord Jesus Christ with the rich man, he did not argue with him. He did not per, uh, try to persuade him. He told him the truth. You need one thing. Go sell all what you have, give to the poor and follow me. So uh, an heated argument actually will not reach any conclusion at the end. It is a waste of time and waste of energy. So we can start an, uh, a discussion. And if, if, if I feel uh, uh, my, my goal, I will not persuade anybody, but I will say the truth and defend the truth clearly without intention to persuade or to attack, to say, you're wrong. You, you think uh, you are prejudiced. You, you came from a third world country. That's why you think this way. Pointing finger and attacking, that's what makes things heat. But I say the truth. And if the other actually not ready to listen to it right now, then maybe this would be the end of the discussion for now. All of us, we need some time to process what we hear. So maybe what I, when I hear you right now, I say, you know what? Um, I'm not convinced. Then I process it later on and then I become convinced and I come and ask more questions. Another thing actually, the Lord used, Jesus Christ used it with the people. He challenged them by question. So he, he asked them some questions and let them think about this question. You know? So 
if somebody is so entitled to his opinion and just you ask them to, what about this question and leave them don't demand answer right now but when people start to think about this question they will examine they will realize their prejudice or how they are entitled to wrong opinion the lord one time he told them the baptism of john is from heaven or from earth he asked them is it right to give taxes to caesar or not uh, he told them uh, they asked him this question so th the lord many times he challenged them by you know asking them question but he never went into a heated discussion with anybody so we should not let the discussion reach this level of heated discussion Christy Abdel Malik Hi Amber Yusuf thank you so much for your lecture I really appreciated it today I like the flag um, behind you Christy Thank you yeah <laughs> I did that on purpose <laughs> um, My question is kind of uh, going off of William's first question um, how do we approach someone when it comes to voting. A lot of times when I speak to um, Coptic Christians, especially older ones that do vote, they say that they vote, they, they don't wanna take into consideration the person, they only wanna take into consideration the church's stance on certain political issues. And they, they come towards, you know, and they say, I'm gonna vote for this party specifically for these reasons because the church believes this way. Um, and just for an example, like the two that I always hear is based on abortion and homosexuality. And they say the church does not agree with these things. We're, we're going to vote for a party that also does not agree with these things. And I, I, this goes back to William's question because he was asking about when we're voting, how do we vote within the best interest, you know, as a Christian and as someone who's voting in the best interest of those who are oppressed. Um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that, because, you know, in conversations with these people, they have a point. The Coptic history in our church does, you know, have a say where they fall on these lines. But um, in the modern world, the lines are a little more blurred. To tell so. you the truth, this is a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. I, I agree. <laughs> because what? There is no agenda that's perfect agenda. There is no agenda that's perfect agenda. So every agenda has its positive and its negative. And every candidate has his positive and his negative. And uh, here actually the question is, if I comprom compromise Christian value, can I really pursue uh, justice in a community or in a world that actually not honoring the, the values of God and the values of, of, of Christianity? Can uh, those who advocate that they are supporting Christian values do they really support Christian values or just using this to get popularity and get support? So what I'm trying to say, there is no white or black answer, you know, to your question, right or wrong answer. But I think it needs a lot of prayer and a lot of uh, heavenly wisdom to put the agenda of each party and the agenda of each person and to see the, the pros and cons of each thing and then you decide what you are willing to compromise at the end and what you are willing to accept you know uh, but as you said uh, Christian values are very, very important to be considered, as well as the characteristic of the candidate himself or herself should also be considered. So uh, it needs a lot of, of wisdom 
and a lot of uh, prayer that the Holy Spirit will guide us to make right choices for, uh, for our country. Thank you, Uncle Yusuf. And also not to be influenced by the opinion of the others. Yani you need to be objective uh, because sometimes, the, especially the media, the news, the social media brainwash us. So we need to be objective to see the world from the eyes of Christ, not from the eyes of anybody else. Okay, I think that we we asked Emba Yusuf only for one hour and he was extremely gracious in giving us an hour and a half. So thank you so much. I think that I speak for everybody when I say that this was uh, an immense pleasure. I think, I think we all learned a lot. This was so much better than any of us could have imagined. So thank you, Sayedna. Thank um, you. If you need to jump off the call, please feel free. Um, I did have a few announcements relating to the organization that I just wanted to give everybody as an update. So in the chat box, I went ahead and I posted pretty much all of these relevant resources. I think it would be good for you guys to plug into. If you're not already plugged into, that's um, our LinkedIn group, the Facebook group, and the group me. Those are the three internal things that we have uh, that kind of gather the membership in one place. And if you're not a member yet, um, and to qualify as a member, we just ask that you're either in law school, a practicing attorney, or pre-law uh, of some sort. You can fill out our contact form that's also in the uh, chat box on the right. There's been discussion about the next meeting. Um, I think people don't like Thursday so much, so we're going to discuss that a little bit and see if we can do anything about that. But if we stick with that... Yes. August 6th, um, so exactly four weeks from now, that we'll be meeting next and we'll be doing kind of a kickoff for school event. So we'll be having a few different... William, you cut up. And uh, I don't know what happened to William, <laughs> but and I have to leave. It was my pleasure to meet all of you. God bless you all. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I, I pray for all of you and you also pray for me. Bye, thank everybody. You. Thank, you. Thank, okay. you so much, thank you. 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 Bye bye. Oh, no. <laughs>